Welcome back to Block TV. It's time now for Long Read Sundays. Now, it's no secret that the crypto Twitter is a never ending stream of information, thoughts, and discussions about the world of cryptocurrency. It's a mammoth task keeping track of it all, but luckily for us and for you, we're joined every week by Nathaniel Whittemore, who lives and breathes the ecosystem and combines all the best of the best into his Long Read Sunday Twitter column. Nathaniel, firstly, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, and before we actually get into the Long Read Sunday for this week, we're going to talk about some uh, late breaking news that came out in just the last couple of hours. The long awaited, awaited backed options trading has just come online, announced by Backed itself officially in a Medium post put out by their COO. Uh, Nathaniel, as this is the sort of latest news coming out on the table, I wanted to get your reaction on what you think about this new instrument hitting the crypto sphere. Well, so I think I think with Backed, you know, it's interesting. Backed is uh, emblematic of a bunch of different shifts. On the one hand, they're emblematic of um, not necessarily a shift away from retail, but the emergence of institutional investors as a meaningful part of this market, right? Like that was what Backed was always supposed to be about is, is a signaling that institutions were ready to come in. Um, and I think that uh, part of that, what, what, what does it mean to shift from retail to institutional? Well, one of the things is that the pace of change is slower and what we can expect from changes are slower. And so if you remember when people, uh, people were putting a lot of their hopes when Backed was announced um, in 2018. It was in the middle of a bear market and uh, and people really were hopeful that that would be some huge shift to, to send the price straight to the moon again. And what's happened, of course, is that Backed being focused on a different type of client has been playing a long game and slowly adding new products. And uh, and we've seen, you know, when when Backed first launched their physically settled futures a couple months ago. People were just waiting in the wings to to call it a failure because it didn't uh, pop right away. But it's been this kind of steady, uh, steady growth in that. And now the the next part of their um, their approach, I guess, is adding on uh, additional products that can build off the, the the pricing index that they have now with their physically settled futures. So that's kind of what their post is about today. Is about uh, how this mirrors other products that the Intercontinental Exchange has put out that have become uh, benchmarks and other industries and and you know why this why this matters but i think that the 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 key takeaway is um you know backed is clearly investing in uh, a lot of different products in this industry they're playing a long game and so every time there's a new bit of news i think the way that we should think about it isn't what will be the immediate price impact uh, how does this impact things you know over the next week or two but more how does this uh, or does this make this space uh more open inviting useful uh for a, a new category of investors because that's kind of the the, mm. the hope now, certainly it is the hope and it segues us nicely into the long read sunday starting with your number five for this week and that is talking about the fundamentals of the bitcoin uh, industry as a whole in particular focusing on the metric of uh, addresses uh, bitcoin addresses which are now at all-time highs nathaniel what drew your attention to this and why do you think this particular metric is so key for the industry so the the Kind of the we're we're coming now to the end of the year. End of the year is obviously when everyone reflects on what's happened in the year before and how we should feel, especially as compared to the beginning of the year, right? Uh, this year it has an even higher stakes because we're coming to the end of an entire decade. Uh, obviously, the first decade of of Bitcoin and crypto's life is coming to a close, and so that that uh, propensity to want to reflect and, and take stock of where we are is even higher. Um, and I think that the the interesting thing is that in some ways there's been kind of a, a gloom or even a boredom a little bit. Um, and part of that may simply be that the price is now, you know, something like 45, 46% off the highs that we reached in the middle of the year. Uh, but it's it's interesting if you kind of take a step away from what, uh, you know, what just the, the exclusive price action, there's a lot that's really positive uh, going into going into the new year and closing out this year. So one of those uh, positive indicators that I noticed was Alex Thorne, who works at uh, Fidelity's venture fund in crypto, Avon Ventures, um, was pointing out that the, the number of of total addresses holding Bitcoin is now at an all-time high, even which was previously reached uh, in January of 2018. Um, and he actually does a, a bunch of work using CoinMetrics uh, data to show why, you know, he, he uh, effectively he acknowledges that this is an imprecise metric because lots and lots of holdings are effectively um, 
mingled in the in the holdings accounts of uh, exchanges if people are just leaving their money on exchanges. But still, even with that, that's more likely to underestimate than overestimate anything. So it's a really positive signal, right? Like the number of actual pure, the pure breadth of people who are participating uh, in holding Bitcoin in some ways is, is at an all time high. And that's just kind of one of the, the positive indicators. Again, if you get away from just strictly speaking, the, the immediate price action. Um, another great kind of uh, reflection of this was the, the second piece that I, I kind of combined with number five uh, around um, just the, the technical developments going on around Bitcoin, right? So uh, so Lucas Nutzi, who has had, uh, he's really uh, kind of prolific uh, technology-based writer uh, around Bitcoin, um, put out this piece where it shows, he tries to actually landscape just how many uh, new things are being built on top of Bitcoin. And he goes through kind of category by category. He looks at mining technology. He looks at uh, layer two privacy technology. He looks at um, just a number of different pieces of this pie. And again, it, it's kind of just never been more robust. So, you know, this is a, a constant uh, reflection uh, or, or a constant kind of um, reminder that that those uh, in the Bitcoin industry have for, for other folks who have been here for less time. But um, it's so easy to get swallowed up in the price action. And obviously that price action is a lot of what attracts people to the space in the first place. However, um, if you step away, there are often the indicators can look very different. Well, certainly, uh, price is but one indicator among many in a network that is building, growing and developing in so many different facets. But a key part of that development, uh, Nathaniel, and I'm sure you'll agree here, is not just simply growth at all costs, but ensuring that the growth is done intelligently and in concert with uh, a lot of the systems that exist in the real world. And this brings us nicely to our number four for this week, which is talking about uh, what have been labeled these last mile issues uh, within the Bitcoin network, about getting that connectivity into individuals' hands. Now, uh, take us through uh, your tweet on this one for this week, Nathaniel. Sure. So, I mean, as someone who pays a lot of attention to uh, the, the almost like the meta narrative and, and what we're talking about, one of the things that I think has been really positive this year is that the, the conversation about Bitcoin and other cryptos, but particularly Bitcoin, has moved out of just the speculative into the real world, uh, particularly in the context of uh, places that are experiencing uh, political unrest, or uh, or you know hyperinflation, or uh, or, or capital controls, and um, th that's positive all on its own. But I think what's even more positive is that because of that, we're now having a more sophisticated conversation about what the limitations are. Right? It's not just used as kind of a uh, a, a football to try to uh, make a point about Bitcoin's uh, plausibility in the real world, but instead people are actually digging into uh, to what the challenges are. And so this piece from Coindesk, from Lee over at Coindesk, um, effectively is going into, she looks at uh, protesters in uh, a, a bunch of different parts around the world, uh, people who are political dissidents, and finds that a lot of the challenges to using Bitcoin um, remain, even if they're interested in what the technology can do. Uh, and that has to do with um, governments controlling the actual uh, internet access, so that's ISP level issues. It includes uh, simple issues of liquidity, if, you know, these are networks ultimately, and if uh, uh, there are only so many people using the network that's going to limit its its capacity to to actually help. So um, I think that this just reflects again a, a maturing of the conversation in a really important way going into the next year, where you know we're putting Bitcoin in the context of these places that that really do uh, need something to address uh, the challenges of kind of the the local monetary regimes and the local political regimes they're facing. But we're we're getting beyond just the the plausibility of that and looking practically at, at what else needs to be built uh, to make that actually happen. Yes, certainly, uh, 2019 has proven itself to be a, a year of mass protests and uh, potentially a lot of use cases out there for Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies around the world. Whether or not uh, it's able to do that in the real world environment, the test is on the table and it's now up to the crypto industry to step up. But as well as being a year of protest, uh, there was another year uh, that 2019 arguably was the year of, and this brings us to our number three for this week, uh, Nathaniel, 2019, the year of DeFi. Why do you think uh, that managed to be the case in a year where many would uh, come out and say that DeFi was a bit of a non-entity? Uh, what uh, metrics and uh, thoughts are you pulling on from here? 
Sure. Well, so I think uh, just for context, I think we're just at the beginning of this uh, great end of the year content, and I'm really excited for it because I love <laughs> people debating about this sort of thing. I think it's a great context to learn. And so I started to flag a few of the different arguments. I actually have a different argument. I think this was the year that uh, we up leveled the, the stakes of the game in terms of the digital currency wars, which maybe we'll get into uh, in a minute or so. That would be my pick for for um, the narrative of the year of 2019. But I think that you know you can make a plausible argument argument that DeFi was uh, was an incredibly important narrative in this year. And so, you know, DeFi started to, to really have uh, really emerge as a force um, towards the end of uh, end of 2018. Um, you saw a lot of the efforts in the Ethereum community shift over from uh, from kind of the ICO and tokenize the world and build these kind of network alternatives to big Silicon Valley companies to uh, open finance and decentralized finance. And so this piece, which comes now from consensus, obviously, which has a stake, uh, a horse in this fight. Um, but it does. It's a great kind of look and overview, arguing that this was the most significant trend. And I do think that if you look at how much energy and attention was around projects like MakerDAO this year, uh, that you can make a compelling argument that this was a thing. Now, uh, DeFi, like everything else in this space, is subject to uh, accelerated expectations. And so I think that there's a counter argument around how much it actually accomplished. There's also a whole set of critiques, like as DeFi becomes more and more uh, a key part of the crypto landscape, more of the questions that are really important uh, are starting to come up in terms of, uh, you know, central points of failure, in terms of uh, whether we're just kind of recreating um, some systems which are unstable in the traditional financial world, maybe with even lower guardrails. But I think that even if you start to see those arguments, it becomes pretty undeniable that uh, it's one of the, you know, three, four, five, maybe major things that people have been talking about this year and debating about. Uh, and I think that's worth noting. It certainly is a key element. And as you say, uh, those end of year narratives, how it all plays out, what 2019 will be remembered for, and end of uh, decade narratives for that point are also going to be a very interesting one for us to, to be all looking at. I'm sure we'll speak about it a lot in the next month or so. But in the meantime, let's move on to number two, where you, as you alluded to earlier, the discussion about a digital currency war that may well be underway. Uh, Nathaniel, tell us your thoughts. Sure. So, you know, like I said, as, as I start to think about what end of year, the year narratives are, um, to me, the, the, the absolute biggest is the emergence of uh, or the clarity that we're seeing with the the combatants in a digital currency war, right? We with when Libra announced uh, their project, it was like a starting gun for the governments around the world. It was the first time I think that most of them have taken the threat of a private crypto money seriously. Uh, Bitcoin was this you know fringe thing and whatever they needed to pay attention to it. Uh, maybe in some places they wanted to actually try to kind of get rid of it, uh, but it didn't feel like it had the scale. You know, it had been around for ten years, it had been bubbling forever, and and it never really seem to make a dent. Whereas Zuckerberg, who already was, you know, uh, kind of a, a cowboy relative to the power systems in the world, um, when he says that he's going to bring his, you know, two billion members along with, with the community of Facebook, that got everyone's attention. And I think that even making that, uh, but what really kind of cemented this as the, the key narrative of this year was the response of governments around the world, but particularly China, right? The acceleration that we saw on their digital yuan projects, um, that has really set the tone for now other governments are, are actually actively looking at what their answer is going to be because uh, maybe they don't like Libra, but they feel like the threat of China is unignorable. So we have this, this heightened, uh, heightened question of the stakes of this entire industry, right? Before it was something that they could kind of just write off often and, uh, and you know have have junior staffers basically write reports on that they were never going to really read until you know the hearing that was coming up you know three months from now or whatever um, it's it's not like that anymore and so uh, Paul Vigna uh, over at the Wall Street Journal wrote uh, effectively about how this is becoming a, a more significant geopolitical issue and I anticipate that doing nothing but increasing uh, over the course of the next year. Yes, uh, it does seem like it will be a narrative that's going to grow with uh, the global tensions that are surrounding it. It doesn't seem like it's going anywhere anytime soon. But now let's turn to your number one for this week, which is an interesting uh, thread and thought piece by Raul Pal talking about the potential of blockchain, in particular the massive uh, development, uh, brain drain as he calls it, into the space that is the blockchain and cryptocurrency world, uh, a deep uh, in-depth thread. Uh, Nathaniel, tell us what you uh, drew out of this particular thought process. 
I think that the reason that I wanted to highlight this piece is that, again, if you, if you kind of read the full Long Read Sunday, I start with this interesting question about why, why when there's so many positive fundamental indicators, have we also seen a bunch of content about people being bored with the space or people being frustrated? And I think that the, the reminder that comes from this is, you know, Rao Paul has really kind of returned, come back uh, into this industry this year. You know, he is a, he's a traditional finance person. For the last few years, he's, building a, he's been building a media company, Real Vision, which is basically a... Uh, YouTube for finance in some ways. Um, and he had flirted with Bitcoin before, as a lot of those finance guys did. But he, to his own admittance, got uh, kind of turned off when the Bitcoin cash fork happened. He thought that that was going to be, you know, so value destructive that it might signal the end of things. And he's really come back through uh, through the Bitcoin doors this year. And now, as he gets deeper and deeper in, he's just seeing so many things that are fascinating to him. And he's drawing the connections to uh, to his world. And I think what's so valuable about this is that, um, you know, the when, when you have folks who are from an outside perspective, uh, kind of live narrate the, the, the fall down the rabbit hole, it's a great way to remember um, what's so interesting about this and why it is still such a, such a neutron star for talent. And, and I think that one of the most positive indicators in some ways is that if really smart people continue to spend their time uh, investigating this, it, it, what comes out may not look like exactly what we all want or what we plan, but something interesting happens, right? Uh, you, you can't really concentrate the, the amount of talent that is uh, finding its way to the space and not see it impact the world in some way. And now, how, how that actually shapes out, whether it's one protocol, whether it's many, whether it's, you know, the, the power structures that be uh, co-opting some of what we built, like these are all open questions and, and all good reasons to stay involved if, if you feel like you have a, a stake in that, the answers to that. But um, what, again, coming back to undeniability, what's undeniable is that as 2019 closes, we're still seeing more and more folks find their way into this industry. And, and frankly, I think that in some ways, the folks who find their way in when the market's not soaring is even more interesting to me. Uh, another thing actually, now that I'm just thinking about this and saying this out loud is the chain smokers just announced their support for a blockchain fund, which would have been a, a, a joke and laughable at the end of 2017 or the beginning of 2018 and quite on brand for just the, you know, the, the type of people that were coming in. But at the end of 2019, it's like, what the hell is here for them now? Unless they are actually working with folks who have been through it and are really excited, which seems to be the case. So uh, I think that it's going to be really interesting to see always, um, you know, what what people write the story of the end of the, you know, at the end of the year. But uh, at least in one little corner of the world, this is an indicator that there's still a lot of interest and excitement and, and new energy that's that's pouring in. It is undoubtedly a, a mammoth movement, as you say, of, of energy that is pouring into this network. Uh, it is exciting to see how it develops. You've got me very excited, Nathaniel, for all these end of year, end of decade narratives that we're going to see panning out. It maybe is a good time. I know, just... Please. <laughs> Get, get used to it for the next three weeks or four weeks or whatever. Every, every Long Read Sunday is going to be another culmination probably of, uh, uh, of what's been said. But that's, I mean, it's a fun, it's an end of decade thing. That's such a monumentous occasion. It is certainly a truly monumentous time. I look forward to going over it week by week with you, Nathaniel. So make sure for those at home to stay with us at blocktv.com for all the latest in news, information, and the best of analysis. I'm Asher Westrop Evans. Thanks for watching. For more news and updates, follow us on Twitter.